Thank you guys uh, very much for coming. Uh, I appreciate it, uh, especially those of you who are coming to my second talk of the day. Uh, I don't even want to listen to me talk that much, so uh, I appreciate it. Um, and I guess I should start, uh, I always tell my students when they're writing papers that a uh, philosophy paper is not a mystery novel, so you, the conclusion should not be a surprise we encounter at the end. Uh, and so uh, in that sense, I'm going to try not to bury the lead, uh, and I'm just going to say up front, that roughly put, Adam Smith's account of why we should fear death and feel sorry for the deceased is because it would really be unpleasant to be buried alive uh, and everybody treat you like you were dead. Uh, and that uh, sounds a little bit not like the most natural explanation, so I'm going to try and do the work in this talk of explaining why that is, I think, uh, at least an interesting and potentially uh, more plausible than we might have appreciated story about what's going on. Uh, so that's the, that's the headline. Uh, Adam Smith thinks being buried alive would be unpleasant. That's why you should fear death. Okay. So uh, the opening puzzle, and I'm not going to go into these puzzles in great detail, um, but the opening puzzle, sort of a, a pair of related puzzles, um, we're all familiar, I, I don't know why I say we're all familiar, many people are familiar, uh, with the arguments from Lucretius and Epicurus uh, about the irrationality of fearing death. Uh, or why we shouldn't fear death, or why death is nothing to fear. Um, and they mostly revolve around the idea that death is, a, is not a state of being, it's a, it's a lack of any such state. And so as a result, there's, it's not a it can't be a bad thing that's happening to you, and so the fear is irrational. Um, and that is probably not the, the, the best presentation of those arguments that have ever been given, but it's good enough for our purposes. Um, there's a related set of puzzles that face people who buy into certain brands of theistic uh, religious uh, doctrine. Um, and that is for people where uh, they are likely, or at least possible, to receive, uh, instead of a negative afterlife, or a lack of afterlife, as in the Epicurean or Lucretian uh, perspective, a uh, super awesome, happy afterlife. So if you have a good chance of going to heaven, there is also a puzzle about why death would be something to fear, uh, because if you wind up in heaven, that would be uh, presumably awesome and exciting, rather than something to be feared. So, so there's a similar puzzle uh, for people who think that death, you, there is life after death, provided they have the right view about whether it's good or bad. Um, so uh, I guess if you had the view that everybody was going to go to a bad place when they died, you would avoid this puzzle. And it would be pretty natural. You'd be like, yeah, everybody should fear death. You're going to the horrible place. Um, okay. So... We can separate three questions that sort of relate to this issue. Sorry, let me take a step back. Um, so those, those are directly about whether or not death is bad for the person who died. Um, there's a related question, which is that when somebody that we know dies, uh, when, when, we have, uh, when we lose a loved one or we uh, encounter death uh, in our lives, uh, a lot of our emotional response is, is feeling, bad for our, not, uh, feeling bad for ourselves because it sounds like you're sort of dwelling in un, un, uh, legitimate pity, but you feel bad because you've suffered a loss. You loved that person, they enriched your life, you cared about them, it was sort of it was a positive aspect of your life and it's gone. And that's not where the puzzle is supposed to come in. The puzzle is supposed to come in in the part where you also feel like they've lost out. You feel like they are missing something, like it is sad for them. Uh, so if you think of a parent who dies and doesn't get to see their child get married, uh, and you think, well, that's bad for the child because the child wanted the parent to be there at the wedding, but if you also might think, well, that's very sad for that parent that they didn't get to see their child get married. Uh, and related to these uh, Epicure uh, Epicurean and Lucretian puzzles, there's a puzzle about why we should feel bad for the person who deceased, uh, who, who is deceased. So there's three questions uh, that I've got on the, on the sheet. We're only going to look at two of them today. Um, uh, and uh, so, but I'm going to go through all three of them right now. Uh, so the first question, and these categories are uh, arbitrary to an extent. Uh, I mean, I tried to get names that made sense, but anyway. So there's an ethical slash metaphysical question about death and whether it can be bad for the person who's deceased. And that's just the question of how death could be bad for the person who's deceased. After all, they're not around anymore to suffer any ill effects. So they, they can't be a state of suffering or so on. Um, and I'm going to presuppose uh, that the death is... Uh, either not bad uh, because it's nothing, or that it's good for the remainder of the talk. And if people are uh, worried that that's unfair of me to do, we can talk about that during the Q&A. Um, but at least for the purpose of this puzzle, it's, it's the perspective we need to take. 
So that's, the, that's an ethical slash metaphysical question. It's a question about like, how could there be uh, uh, something that is bad for someone if there's no one there for it to be bad for? Um, and that question we're not going to talk about today. It's a very interesting question. A lot of good stuff has been done on it, but um, it's not going to be our focus. Second is a, what I'm calling a broadly epistemological question because it has to do with rationality. Um, but it's not strictly speaking epistemological, I guess. Uh, or it might be, it might not be. Uh, but sort of under a big tent conception of epistemology, we have this question, do we make a mistake when we feel bad for someone who has died? Are we doing something wrong? Is our feeling erroneous? Uh, is it an irrational emotion? A uh, bunch of different ways of spelling out the question in detail, but that's the broadly epistemological question is sort of, uh, is there something erroneous about that emotion? And then the third question that I have on the list is uh, labeled broadly psychological, and it's sort of a descriptive question about the origins of certain emotions, specifically in this case, uh, where does our feeling bad for deceased people come from? Because even if we think uh, the answer to the first question is death can't be bad for that person, and so consequently we think we're making some sort of mistake when we do feel bad for them, uh, it's still the case that we ordinarily do feel bad, not just for ourselves, but for the person who has died. Uh, and so there should be some story about the mechanisms that produce that emotion. So my goals in the talk are going to be three, threefold. Um, first, we're going to talk through Adam Smith's account of sympathy in general. Uh, it's the cornerstone of uh, his views that he lays out in the theory of moral sentiments, um, and a huge part of his moral theory, and his uh, theory of um, uh, social and political life. Um, so it's hugely important uh, to his views overall. Uh, but in his discussion of sympathy in general, he talks about the case of sympathy for the deceased. Um, so that is going to be our discussion. Uh, we're going to open by talking about Smith's account of sympathy uh, in general, and then also how it applies specifically in the case of the deceased. Um, second thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about a weird, uh, weird is probably not the right word, an interesting subset of cases uh, that I call unmatched sympathy that Smith builds, sorry, builds in is, is misleading, that is part of Smith's overall account of sympathy but plays a really interesting role in a range of cases of our emotional reactions. And the term unmatched there comes from the fact that sympathy, etymologically speaking, the literal root of the word sympathy is uh, feeling with. So to feel sympathy, sort of, if you were to take the etymology seriously, would be to feel in tandem with someone. It is to have the same emotion they are having. And so in cases where they are not having the emotion, the term sympathy is a bit of a misnomer, uh, but Smith still seems to incorporate those under the, the account of sympathy he offers, and I'm not really interested in debating whether or not it's correct to term them specifically sympathy, but at any rate, uh, there are these cases where your sympathy is unmatched, there's no emotion in the person that you're feeling sympathy for that matches the sympathy that you're feeling, and those are, for Smith, a feature, not a bug. It's not a problem for him that he has these cases, he likes that he has these cases, at least the way he discusses them, it sounds like he likes it. I can't speculate too much on his state of mind. Um, and then third, uh, where we're going to end, is that I'm going to try and argue that Smith's answer to three can support, that's the question, why do we feel bad for the deceased, can help us support a negative answer to question two, do we make a mistake when we feel bad for the deceased? And so, uh, without tangling with question one, whether or not death is actually bad for the deceased, I think Smith has carved out an interesting space where he can say, we feel bad for the deceased for these, for this, because of this story, and we're not making a mistake in doing so. So that's, that's the sketch of the talk. All right. Um, I'm going to start by looking at Smith's account of sympathy, which I have labeled easy as pie. Uh, and that is a pun, because there are three components to Smith's account of sympathy. Uh, perception, imagination, and emotional reaction. Uh, before we get into those components, we're going to look at a long quote, and I apologize, because uh, I don't normally like reading long quotes, but... I can't do better than Smith did in saying some of these things. He's a very good writer. Um, so if you don't enjoy this quote, that's almost certainly my fault and not his. Okay, so quote one on your, on your handout, uh, on the second page of the handout, Q1. As we have no immediate experience of what other men feel, we can form no idea of the manner in which they are affected, but by conceiving what we ourselves should feel in like situation. Though our brother is upon the rack, as long as we ourselves are at ease, our senses will never inform us of what he suffers. They never did and never can carry us beyond our own person. And it is by the imagination only that we can form any conception of what are his sensations. 
Neither can that faculty help us to this any other way than by representing to us what would be our own if we were in his case. It is by the impressions of our own senses, not only those of, uh, only, not those of his, which our imaginations copy. By the imagination, we place ourselves in his situation, we conceive ourselves enduring all the same torments, we enter, as it were, into his body, and become in some measure the same person with him, and thence form some idea of his sensations, and even feel something which, though weaker in degree, is not altogether unlike them. His agonies, when they are thus brought home to ourselves, when we have thus adopted and made them our own, begin at last to affect us, and we then tremble and shudder at the thought of what he feels. For as to be in pain or distress of any kind excites the most excessive sorrow, so to, con so to conceive or imagine that we are in it excites some degree of the same emotion in proportion to the vivacity or dullness of the conception. Okay. Um, so as I said, I really enjoy his writing style. Um, uh, but here's my hack job on what he just said um, on the other sheet of the handout, back to the first page. Uh, and I've divided it into a three-stage process. Uh, P for perception, I for imagination, and E for emotional reaction. And I, I should note here um, that uh, my interpretation is diverging somewhat from the interpretation uh, offered by uh, D.D. Raphael in his book on Smith, uh, The Impartial Spectator. Um, and uh, just, I don't think in a substantive, I don't think in a, in a large substantive way, I, I take the imagination to play more of a role than I think he does. Uh, but uh, at any rate, okay. I just thought I should flag that. So the three-stage process looks like this. First, there's a physical perception of some state of affairs involving the other person. So S perceives uh, the target circumstances, C. Now those circumstances are not internal circumstances, the way it's been described. Those circumstances are external circumstances, such as, uh, like if they're sitting on a spiky chair, uh, it's that they're sitting on a spiky chair, not the pain. You don't directly perceive their pain. Um, then, this physical perception triggers in you an act of conception or imagination. Uh, and I've labeled this perspectival imagination because what's important is you're not just dispassionately imagining that someone is uh, sitting on a spiky chair. Rather, what you do is you imagine sitting in a spiky chair. Okay? So you, in your imagination, you are playing the role of person sitting in the spiky chair. Uh, so you imagine yourself experiencing those circumstances. See? Uh, and then this act of imagining triggers in you, uh, the third step, E, an emotional reaction to that imagining. Um, and so that, in this case, would be sadness. Uh, I don't know that sadness is the immediate thing that comes to my mind when I imagine sitting in a spiky chair, but um, it works better if we take something a little bit more uh, emotionally moving, like uh, loss of a loved one or something like that. If you imagine somebody has suffered a, a devastating emotional tragedy, uh, and then you imagine yourself sort of in those shoes, you can get yourself to experience the sadness as well. Okay. So now, some important things to note about how the different uh, elements of this mechanism come together. Part one, uh, the first two elements, uh, the perception and the imagination, they go on what we now term the cognitive side of the cognitive cognitive divide. Um, and back in Smith's day, this was more commonly referred to as the division between the will and the understanding, where the understanding was sort of the thinky part of your mind, and the uh, will was where all the emotions lived. Not true for everybody, not true across the board, but that's sort of the rough division. Cognitive is sort of the thoughtful, thinking, representational part of your mind, and the cognitive is the sort of desiring, directed, emotional part. So elements P and I both belong to the cognitive side of the cognitive-cognitive divide. They're both representational, perceptual, uh, or uh, understanding-related states. Element E, that's the emotional reaction, that's obviously going to be on the cognitive side of the divide. Um, and uh, the most important part of this is that only one of these three elements seems to involve a judgment. Um, that is, element P, that's the perception of their circumstances, involves in some sense, judging that person to be in those circumstances. 
But when you just imagine yourself in those circumstances, you're not judging that you're in the circumstances, you're not making any judgments whatsoever, you're just imagining. And similarly, when you have the emotional reaction, you are not judging, you are just emotionally reacting. So the only clear-cut element of this mechanism that has a judgment involved is the perceptual element. Okay. So that's some of the basic features. Now I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of uh, other features that are important to note about his account uh, in the hopes uh, that they will be of interest to you as they are to me. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to treat them together. Uh, I think that there's a difference between these two features, but I, it's, it's a very subtle difference, and I don't know that it's very profitable for us because they go hand in hand for, for Smith. Um, but the two features in question are directness and uh, immediacy, or for Smith, the lack of those two features. So Smith's account is both indirect and mediated. Um, and I'm going to just treat those two together, but there is, I think, a difference between uh, the, the path by which the emotion gets uh, done and then also what it is responding to. So, uh, but in general, uh, what's crucial is that Smith's account is indirect. Um, and that's how I'm going to talk about it for the rest of the talk. Uh, and to draw out the difference between a direct and an indirect account, I've got two helpful cases, or at least I think they're helpful, I hope they're helpful. Uh, and to make sure I get the, uh, the descriptive elements, to try my hand at a little bit of fiction writing for this. It's not very engaging fiction, it's just description of human beings in scenarios. Uh, I guess that's probably most fiction. Uh, okay. So, uh, we're going to start with case one, the case of the sad stranger. And I want you all, uh, if, if you would indulge me, to close your eyes and try to vividly imagine what I'm about to describe and forgive my faults as a writer. So you come across a, sitter, uh, a stranger sitting alone in a cafe, bleary-eyed, lower lip quivering, on the verge of tears. You see the manifestation of deep, intense sorrow. The gut-wrenching reaction produced in you by such a sight does not seem to stem from imagining yourself in the stranger's circumstances. After all, they're just sitting at a cafe table. That's not an especially sorrowful situation to sit in. You don't perceive the circumstances of theirs that prompt the sadness. You only perceive the sadness itself. Okay, you can open your eyes and stop imagining now for a moment. Um, in this case, it looks like what's going on is that you are responding to the display of the emotion. Somehow seeing the manifestations of, of a sad countenance is triggering your sympathetic sorrow. You feel sad for them, but you don't know what's gone wrong. You don't know if they lost a pet, you don't know if they uh, have suffered uh, some other loss, or you have no idea why they're sad. Maybe they're sad because their lottery ticket didn't win, and if you knew that, you wouldn't actually feel that sad for them. But you don't know, but your sadness is still triggered. Um, now this sort of case looks like it presents a challenge for Smith's account, because Smith's account just said, well, here's how it goes. First, you see the circumstances that are generating the emotion. Then you imagine being in those circumstances, and that generates the emotion in you. And then you have the emotional reaction. But here, it looks like we're sort of avoiding that whole intermediate process. Now, there's a distinction in more recent work on emotions. Um, I don't know. I think it goes back some ways. It might even go back to Smith's day. Uh, but the terminology didn't quite take hold that early. Uh, between contagion theories of sympathy and simulationist theories of sympathy. And Smith's account is a nice example of what we would now classify as a simulationist account. You sort of simulate being in the other person's shoes, and that's where the emotion comes from. Contagion theories are more like sadness is a disease that's catching, and so their sadness sort of rubs off on you just from you being aware of it. Okay. So, so sadness looks like a problem for Smith. Um, we're going to come back to whether sadness is really a problem for Smith, but first we're going to switch to the case that works much better for Smith, which is sympathetic anger. Okay. So, close our eyes again. Turn to the world of imagining, despite my poor prose. <clears throat> Suppose that in the cafe, rather than encounter a stranger wrestling with sorrow and fighting back a wellspring of tears, the stranger you see is impatiently fidgeting, brow furrowed, nostrils flared, with periodic startling flashes of, of rage across the eyes. Despite your immediate recognition of this stranger's agitation and anger, 
you do not react by entering into agitation or anger of your own. You may react with fear or concern, but you do not become wrathful yourself. Okay, we can open our eyes again. Um, now, you might think, okay, that's not a problem, because maybe, we just, maybe anger is not a sympathy-generating emotion. But it looks like a display response of you, a view that says what you're reacting to is the display of the emotion, should say, if you're ever sympathetic to anger, that would be a case where you're sympathetic. You see the display of the anger. Now, as I said, if we never had sympathetic anger, that wouldn't be a problem. But we do have sympathetic anger. Um, and so, uh, here's the case. I don't think you need to close your eyes to imagine this one. Because um, it's not set in a cafe. And I guess that was the reason for closing your eyes. Okay. Now, suppose you see a friend exhibiting such signs of anger. And you ask them what's happened. They begin to share the details, and you take them in. Their boss has been telling them that success on their current assignment will be a key to gaining a long overdue promotion. They had been putting in long hours, sacrificing time at home, and exhausting themselves to ensure success. The assignment was wildly successful, but as they exited the office today, they overheard the boss on the phone offering that promotion to an unexperienced, unqualified outsider who happened to have attended college with the boss. By the end of the story, you too, I predict, if it's me, I too am impatiently fidgeting, feel myself grinding with my teeth and furrowing my brow as well. I am angry on their behalf. I immediately, upon learning the circumstances of their anger, join them in being angry at this jerk of a boss. At least, uh, I do. I don't know about everybody, but to me that works. So, so that's a case where we have sympathetic anger, um, and it looks like the Smith-style account has a really good way to explain that. Namely, I can start imagining the scenario that's producing the anger, I put myself in their shoes, and I think, God, I would want to, you know, strangle my boss in that case. Um, I don't actually want to strangle my boss. Internet. Um, all right. So, so here's, here's the lesson to draw from this pair of cases. Um, I think there's a tension between immediate and non There's a tension between these two cases. Because if you have an immediate account, then you have trouble explaining why you're not angry when you see the angry stranger in the cafe. Why that doesn't generate anger in you. And on the other hand, if you've got a simulationist account or a uh, cause-related account like Smith has, uh, perception of the circumstances prompting the attitude, then you have more trouble explaining why it's so easy to enter into sympathetic sadness without knowing any of the details. So I think no perfectly general account is going to have an easy time with both cases. I don't mean to say that no account that's perfectly general can handle both cases. I just mean one of the cases is much more natural for the simulationist style accounts, and one of the cases is much more natural for the display responsive accounts. So you could either give up having a perfectly general view and have sort of a mixed view that says some emotions are contagious and some emotions are uh, acquired uh, sympathetically simulationist style. Uh, or you could try and come up with some sort of workarounds in either of the two general views. Um, and Smith, uh, to his credit, tries to do something like that. We're not going to talk about <laughs> it today. But he tries to explain how uh, sadness, because the sorts of causes of sadness are so familiar, you can move so easily in your mind, from the display of sadness to possible causes, then you start imagining those possible causes, and that triggers the sadness. Maybe not the most satisfying account of it in the world, but he at least recognizes that it's sort of a, a, a challenge for his view, and he's trying to explain how you can shortcut what looks like this indirect route um, in at least some of these cases. Okay. Now, the thing that's really nice about having an indirect account is that it makes room... And when I say it makes room, that makes it sound like we had to, like, we didn't plan on it and then we, we had to add room for it. But no, uh, what I mean is, it just sort of falls out of this account that you get what I'm calling cases of unmatched sympathy. So now we're sort of towards the uh, unmatched sympathy line on our um, handout. Uh, and uh, indirectness allows for us to sympathize with an emotion that's not there. Um, and I've got a note here, other stories could be compatible with explaining this case, uh, but they don't, they don't automatically explain the case in the same way that Smith's does. So now we are on quote two on the handout. Q2. Shorter quote than before. Sympathy, therefore, does not arise so much from the view of the passion as from that of the situation which excites it. We sometimes feel for another a passion of which he himself is incapable because when we put ourselves in his case, that passion arises in our breast from the imagination though it does not in his from the reality. We blush for the impudence and rudeness of another, though he himself appears to have no sense of the impropriety of his own behavior, because we cannot help feeling 
uh, with what confusion we ourselves should be covered had we behaved in so absurd a manner. So, uh, I embellish Smith's story here a little bit, and I also go for my own neuroses, and so the case, for me, that's the paradigm here of sympathetic embarrassment, uh, is the case where you are at a party, and somebody at the party is drastically underdressed, okay? Like, it's, it's a suit and tie affair, and they're wearing uh, beach shorts and, like, a t-shirt. Um, and because I have uh, worries that I will show up to things underdressed, that is especially primed for me to, like, trigger these emotional reactions. And so I see the person there, and they are completely oblivious to the fact that they stick out like a sore thumb. Okay? They are not embarrassed at all, but I am embarrassed for them. Okay? People who don't like cringe-worthy TV shows, this is a case, if you watch like the original British Office, where David Brent never feels embarrassed by anything he does, and you spend the whole time feeling embarrassed for him, that is a case that Smith not only envisioned, but was happy to claim as part of his view. I mean, not the office in particular, but um, <laughs> on his view, what's going on is the same thing that goes on in other cases of sympathy. The only difference is that person isn't responding with the emotion that you do when you imagine it. So, uh, so these are an interesting set of cases, and the reason that the indirect account allows for them is because you're not responding to a display of embarrassment in that case. That's not what you're waiting for to trigger your sympathetic embarrassment. You are imagining yourself in their shoes, and you get to retain your knowledge of how inappropriate that behavior is when you do that imagining. And so all of a sudden, you are like, oh my god, I would be so embarrassed if that were me. And then, presto, you're embarrassed for them. Um, so this is an interesting case, because it allows us to have sympathy uh, where there is no one to, where there is no emotion to feel alongside, okay? But it's the emotion you would feel if you were in that scenario, or so you imagine. Okay, so now, question. Is sympathetic embarrassment erroneous in some way? Are you making a mistake to feel embarrassed for this person, given that they don't feel embarrassed for themselves? Well, there are three elements to the account, three places where we could ask whether you've made some sort of error. Uh, and so, uh, if we turn our attention to the handout, uh, we've got, first, no error in the perception. It seems clear that in this case, I in fact correctly perceive that this person is wearing the clothes that they're wearing. I'm right about what clothes they're wearing. Uh, I perceive the context of the party, and I see what clothes everybody else is wearing. Um, and I perceive all sorts of other details correctly. My, my perception of the situation is crystal clear. I see exactly what's going on. And I'm not making any mistakes. Now, Question, then I move on. So I, I perceive them behaving that way. Um, if you'd like, you can substitute your own case of inappropriate behavior. Like, maybe you're real big on etiquette and they're using the shrimp fork instead of the salad fork. And, ooh, uh, I wouldn't feel a sympathetic embarrassment in that case. I wouldn't even notice. But, um, so next, you imagine yourself in their shoes. Now here it's interesting because the content of what you imagine is false. So there's, you might think that's room for error because you're imagining something that's not the case. But... That's not, in general, an error with imagination. That's, in fact, one of the things that's nice about imagination is it's not limited to just the things that are the case. You're not making a mistake if you imagine things that aren't actually there. And so it's not clear that you are making any error by imagining... Uh, sorry, I should be stronger. It's not, that you, it's not clear that you're making an error. It's clear that you're not making an error when you imagine yourself in their shoes, and certainly not any more so than you would be in any of the other cases of sympathy. So there's not a special error here, certainly, for the uh, unmatched embarrassment, there's, there's only if there's some sort of error in imagining a situation you're not in, it would be across the board for Smith, even in the cases of matched sympathy. Okay, so then there's the last category, is are you making an error in your emotional reaction? Now, uh, I guess I'm stacking the deck a little bit by saying it's a proper reaction to the imagined circumstances. You can substitute a case where you think the person should feel embarrassed, if that helps, and you don't think being underdressed is such a case. But, uh, what I'm going to say is there's no error in the emotional reaction. That is the right way to react to imagining yourself behaving boorishly or inappropriately in those circumstances. If, I mean, let's just make it rudeness, because that's like way less controversial than that you should feel bad about being underdressed. Although I do, I would feel bad about being underdressed. Um, take a case where somebody sort of receives a nice gift and does not say thank you, and you're like, ooh, I'm so embarrassed for them. Uh, and there you might think it is proper, they should feel embarrassed if they were aware that they had just been that rude. 
Um, so it's a proper reaction to the imagined circumstances. So they've got the three elements, and in none of the three elements is there room for the error to creep in. So uh, if someone's making a mistake here, Smith's going to say, probably it's the person who's not feeling embarrassed by their boorish behavior. They, there is a mismatch, so there's room for an error, but the error is not on your part as the target, as the spectator to the situation, it's on their part as a boorish individual who doesn't feel embarrassed about their boorish behavior. Okay. So that's the rationality of sympathetic embarrassment. Now, we're going to turn our attention to another case where there's no emotion there for you to sympathize with, but you still feel sympathy. And that's the one we open with, and that's the case of sympathy for the deceased. Now, here's why it's important to Smith to have a story about why we fear death. Um, or, rather, why it's important that we fear death. For Smith, it's important that we fear death because the fear of death is crucial, in his view, to the foundation of a civil society. That's the sort of thing we need to, we need to respect and have fear of death, otherwise uh, civil order would break down. I don't know if it's that direct, uh, but it, he says outright that it's uh, part of the foundation of our civil society. So, so here's a puzzle, though, that seems pressing for people who uh, want us to retain the fear of death. Uh, suppose somebody's living a good life, okay, and they are aware that they're living a good life, and they sincerely believe that they have a positive afterlife awaiting them when they die. Why should they fear death? Okay? What, why should death be a frightening prospect for them? It's going to be better than their life on Earth. Okay? They should be excited or exhilarated. Uh, certainly not fearful. Now, uh, I want to take, I wanna take uh, them at face value that they do in fact believe in the afterlife, and that it will be a good one. Uh, but, so then it seems like there's a good case to be made that their fear of death is irrational. Now, there's a couple ways you could try and avoid this, and this talk isn't really about evading this puzzle in particular, so I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. But one way would be to try and maintain that nobody should rationally believe while they're alive that if they were to die right, then they would go to heaven. And, and you could take that view. You could say, like, nobody who is on their way to heaven is in a position to justifiably think that that's what would happen if they died. Uh, but that seems maybe like it would require an inordinate amount of modesty on our parts, because surely some people are correct in thinking that they are living good lives, and correct in thinking that... Uh, that if there is an afterlife awaiting, they would be eligible for the positive afterlife. But, so that's one way to go. Um, another way to go would just be to posit uh, that the fear of death is just a primitive, hardwired element of our psychology, and that uh, maybe if you believe God designed our psychology, that God designed it there so that we could have civil society or something like that. Um, and when I discuss how I think Smith's response to the case goes, it's sort of in that same neighborhood, but I don't think it's exactly the same as just a primitive fear of death. Um, and, uh, okay, so, so here's what Smith says, uh, and, and I think, on reading this, that Smith is going to classify it, just as a natural consequence of his view, not a special circumstance case, as a case of appropriate unmatched sympathy. A case, just like the embarrassment case, where you're not doing anything wrong, even though you have a sympathetic feeling and there's no, nobody there with the feeling that matches. So here's quote three on the handout. We sympathize even with the dead, and overlooking what is of real importance in their situation, that awful futurity which awaits them, we are chiefly affected by those circumstances which strike on our senses, but can have no influence upon their happiness. It is miserable, we think, to be deprived of the light of the sun, to be that shut out from life and conversation, to be laid in the cold grave, to be prey to the corruption and reptiles of the earth, to be no more thought of in this world, but to be obliterated, in a little time, from the affections and almost from the memory of their dearest friends and relations. Surely, I'm just going to go straight into quote four from here. Surely we imagine we can never feel too much for those who have suffered so dreadful a calamity. The tribute of our fellow feelings seems doubly due to them now when they are in danger of being forgot by everybody else. And by the vain honors which we pay to their memory, we endeavor for our own misery artificially to keep alive the melancholy remembrance of their misfortune. That our sympathy can afford them no consolation seems to be an addition to their calamity, and to think that all we can do is unavailing, and that what alleviates all other distress, the regret, the love, the lamentations of their friends can yield no comfort to them, 
serves only to exasperate our sense of their misery. The happiness of the dead, however most assuredly, is affected by none of these circumstances, nor is the thought of these things uh, which can ever disturb the profound, nor is it the thought of these things which can ever disturb the profound security of their repose. So there Smith seems to be saying, we feel bad for the deceased because we look at their physical circumstances of their body after death. And then we imagine ourselves in those physical circumstances, namely being cold and dead and no one's talking to you and you're buried underground. And I guess apparently reptiles are eating you, um, which sounds so much more horrifying than if you just said worms. Uh, maybe they were underground reptiles. Um, but uh, this, this is his story. Uh, and it's just a natural consequence of the way in which the rest of his story of sympathy goes. And it grounds our feeling bad for the deceased is what's going to ground our fear of death. Because we are now responding to our perception of death with this sorrow, sadness, horror uh, at, at the uh, unfortunate trials and tribulations. Even though, and this is what's crucial, even though we know, we are fully aware that they are not experiencing those circumstances. Okay? And so just like with the case of sympathetic embarrassment, we're not making a mistake in our perception of the scenario. We're not making a mistake in what we imagine. We're not making a mistake in our emotional reaction. It's just that there is no one there to have the emotional reaction that we are... There's no one there to have the experience that we're imagining. We're imagining we have that experience, but then there's no one there to match that. So now, leaves us with a final question. Um, and I guess it's a good place for me to end. Uh, I've sort of shown how Smith doesn't have to say you're making a mistake when you feel bad for the dead, or when you, when you feel bad for the deceased, or fear death. Um, but it's not clear that we have gotten what we might think of as true validation of your fear of death or your sympathy for the deceased. And we might just have something like socially pragmatic design, so it's like approvable because it's a useful emotion for people to have, but we're not sort of ratifying it. Um, and one reason you might think we're not getting true validation is that if you look at the beginning of Q question three, he says we're overlooking what's of real importance to them. Um, and if you look uh, in the middle of quotation four, I think. Nope, maybe it's in a quote that's not on the sheet. That's more likely. Because if I ever make a handout that doesn't have a mistake on it, that's a rare day indeed. Uh, Okay, uh, in a paragraph right after the ones that, that I read, I guess I'll, I'll just read this to end, but um, at, towards the end, what Smith concludes, uh, he describes it as an illusion of the imagination that's at work here. Now, that might also give you reason to doubt whether it's true validation, but note, it's the same illusion of the imagination that in some sense is in place any time you have sympathetic uh, emotions whatsoever. And so it's hard to see why that, the illusion is more troublesome or irksome here there would be in other places, apart from the fact that we want to say that there's something wrong with feeling uh, bad on the behalf of someone who's not feeling anything at all. Okay, so I'm just going to read this quote to end, uh, but, but that's, that's where we're left. I think he's closer to true validation than we might have expected, but there is some room uh, to doubt that he's really validated the emotion that you feel at the end there. Uh, and so here's the, the final quote that I'll end with. The idea of that dreary and endless melancholy, which the fancy naturally ascribes to their condition, arises altogether from our joining to the change which has been produced upon them, our own consciousness of that change, from our putting ourselves in their situation, and from our lodging, if I may be allowed to say so, our own living souls in their inanimated bodies. And then, conceiving what would be our emotions in this case, it is from the very illusion of the imagination that the foresight of our own dissolution is so terrible to us, and that the idea of those circumstances which undoubtedly can give us no pain when we are dead, makes us miserable while we are alive. And from thence arises one of the most important principles in human nature, the dread of death, the great poison to the happiness, but the great restraint upon the injustice of mankind, which, while it affects and mortifies the individual, guards and protects the society. Okay. So, uh, there, I feel like it leaves us uh, exactly wanting to know whether this is merely socially pragmatic emotion, or whether he's got true validation, uh, but either way, it's clear that he does not have straightforward room to criticize any of the things that you're doing along the way. Uh, and I will leave it there. Uh, thank you very much.